once I had to move, uh, I was in Edmonton, and I went to, um, at the Citadel, and it was when John Neville was there, that's how long ago it was, uh, he did the Good Soldier Fight, and there was a wonderful moment at the end of the play, and it was what we called Brass Ass Night, <laughs> you know, it was where all the big money funders, etc., came to the theater, and, um, and at the end of, of the play, uh, they were singing, um, there, there's a song in it, you know, the, the river's the river's turning, what's at the bottom is going to come up and what's at the top is going to go down. It's a very powerful song. And uh, the cast and all the sort of World War I uniforms and all the stuff we'd seen uh, came out and started to come down stage uh, to the footlights. And as they came down, the lights started to come up on the audience. So there was this very powerful song with these raggedy soldier <laughs> or image of war in front of you and, 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 a, and a, con a sense of real confrontation to all the brass assy people and actors sitting there. And it was like n nobody understood what it was like. I just didn't understand. Like, I'm sitting there, I've got goosebumps, right? I'm like, mm. And some people are like, you know, is it the end? You know, like, oh, should we, uh, how come the house lights are in? Let's get, should we be going now? Like it was, and I hated everybody in that audience so much. I said, I have to move from Edmonton. I can't, I can't, I can't write in Edmonton because I, I, I have to like, I have to care about the audience. I have to want to communicate to the people who are coming to the, or the piece to communicate something. And I hate all these people and I, and I have to leave here. <laughs> and the, so I moved that time. I directed, um, then there were none as the Christmas show at MTC. Um, now, they phoned me up and asked me to direct it, and I said, why on earth would you want me to direct? Well, you know, because I'd read everything, I got the Christie and blah, 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 so I said, oh, okay. A House, good money just before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we'll get a great cast that really works well together, and I'll try not to get cute about it, because sometimes I have this bad habit of, you know, getting, finding oh, you know, this is really about class, you know, war or some bloody thing that, so I, so I won't get cute about it or try to find anything in it other than what this thing is. So anyway, we, we do the show, opening night, and I'm, you know how they have that funny balcony kind of way up there, and there, there's a moment in which um, all the lights go out, it goes to black and a shot rings out, well, the audience, it was like, ah, and then they burst into this spontaneous applause, right? It was like you had, I had to get up and leave, because I thought, what the hell? I spend all my time trying to write something. All I really have to do is turn off all the lights and fire a gun, you know? <laughs> and that, you know, sure. and that, you know so, so it's, we, we just, there's some really cheap ways to manipulate an audience, you know? And it seems like far too often, and what we keep missing is the real thing is what's happening between the, the people, it, it seems to me. Like, the, like which often I see, I, I don't find that, you know, sufficient exploration has happened on, on the really complex, weird things pe people, people do. And it goes back, I suppose, to me saying everybody wants to be nice to everybody, right? But it's also we're also talking about when you talk about the brass hats or whatever yeah. they are at, at watching and not on, not not receiving what's going on, they've lost the ability to read in those levels. Their ability to sort of uh, read the drama, so to speak, has been shallowed up, as it were. My parallel is hockey. Uh, that you know, when hockey moved, NHL hockey moved to the states, they thought, well, we'll have to put a little uh, thing blur on the puck because no one will know where the puck is. It's moving so fast which meant you cannot appreciate great hockey until you have actually can read it on two or three different levels, right? Mm -hmm. I read this, I read the physical play, I read the passing, I read the playmaking, and I read the team dynamics. But it's like theater, so we can no longer read on these multi-levels, so you have things that are being created that people just can't see anymore. So yeah. you can, if there are levels of perception that need to be regrown, as it were, in an audience. And I don't know how to do that with yeah. 
television on our backs and Hollywood on our backs? I don't know how to do yeah, that. The other interesting thing too, I think, is that we, we build these edifices to the establishment. You know, everything you go in, say, to TC or to ATP, or, and, and, and what are they? When you come in there, this is an endorsement of the status quo. This is an endorsement <laughs> of the establishment. And now let's put good solar spike up there, yeah. and you have all of the audience sitting there who's paid usually a fair amount for their ticket. And when that moment happens, you say, one of these things doesn't belong. What is it? I belong here. I just paid the, you know, this says the red velvet, the wonderful green, you know, all of this says this is not, you know, it's very hard. People come in with an expectation. They don't come in with the expectation to have a stick poked in their eye. And Sharon, aren't you saying your argument is more than just with the theaters? Your argument is with the culture that produces the theaters. Uh, yes, it is. But I think that that's what the theater, real theater, should be about. It should be an, should be saying, "Hey, think about this." You may laugh. Everybody laugh. I can make you laugh. But, but, but think about this when you leave. When you leave, have a fight. About, you may have laughed all the way through it, you know. But it, but it's, it, it's not. You see, I would, I wouldn't say when you said. Uh, whatever and beauty. It's not turning ugly. Ugliness and beauty, right? You yeah. can't see beauty the until beauty you... comes, in my mind, if beauty in that way comes from the unity of the form, the structure, the balance and tension in whatever it is that you've constructed. The construct is, in fact, the performance with the structure, you know, the the, uh, the you know the, the set the text everything. Sorry, so you're talking about the the beauty of a, a piece of written piece of theater. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So the ugliness you can write about something that's ugly, but when what it is you've created that is the the construct and it lives in performance, very vulnerable, the most vulnerable of means, never repeatable, you know. Um, but when there's tension in whatever it is, there's balance and unity of imagination or intellect or, or both in that that's where the beauty of it of it comes in not by turning the ugly into beauty in that the way in which you're you told that story of ugliness is 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 balanced and with you know mm -hmm. tension but balance in that you know it, it, it's like a painting that <laughs> You know, so you can have an, a painting of ugliness, of what's being portrayed, but it's the thing itself, I don't know, so that that penetrates you in a, in, in, in a way. And that's what I want to write. I mean, I don't know that I, that I can, but that's what you want. you want. You want to have a production that penetrates the audience in some way. And of course it can't happen all the time. That's what makes us keep trying to do it, or, or you know, working. But at you're it. also you're talking about the structure of in which that ugly story sits, and how the structure resonates and uh, and reflects all, all the pieces the of, of it. it. You know, the characters. You know, it, it's it's the, it's the same as if you were to build a m more material, concrete thing that had harmony in it and balance, and and the beauty comes from the the closest you've come to the to a kind of ideal if you wanted to go to sort of a would you say then there is a beauty in King Lear in the way it starts at the beginning a man and his three yes. daughters it ends with a man and his yes. dead daughter it goes through the chaos in the That's middle right. of the destruction but in the ugliness of that story there is a majesty in the way that it's framed that actually lifts it into a place that's right. Uh, Only I would go further that say some productions may not be a thing of beauty because the text by itself can't do that. I'm thinking of it in theater as right. a as a it's realized in performance. And you're so talking, you're talking about King Lear? King Lear. King Lear, yeah. Yeah, so all of the <coughs> other elements also in the best of all possible worlds, you know. That the design is such that that it absolutely serves, you know, mm -hmm. and, and endorses that. Uh, that that all all parts of it are um, subliminally endorsing whatever that overall meaning of that work is. 
whether it's in the design, whether it's in the shift of lighting, whether it's the soundscape that's existing, and, and in the performances, the words that are spoken, that all of it is, it, it forms a whole, you know? Uh, and, that, and that that's what we're, you know, that, and, and that's what we're, that's what I'm working for in the theater, which is an impossible thing and never achieved almost, you know? Like <laughs> but you know, that's what it is you're working, that's what it is you're working for, to have that thing that the, the audience feels. We spend all of our life not trying not to feel things that, that to feel them would crush us. You know, whether it's what's happening in Libya or, you know, all, whether in from the cold, whatever families are there that have no place to sleep, whatever, you know. But you've seen productions over your lifetime that have done that for you, have you not? Yes. I suppose I would. I'm Don't tell me you've never seen a production that actually worked. <laughs> I, well, it, that's that little aspect of my personality, sort of, is that I don't, I, I'm, I'm never happy with anything. I always, if there's one little part of it, like of my own work, that is, or a production of my own work, then that's the thing that I tend to look at. Right. I tend to say, oh, yeah, it's wonderful. Oh, but what's the best yeah. production you've ever seen of anybody's work? Of anybody's work? Yep. Oh, God, I don't know. It would be easier to think of moments within works, I think. Um, I, I go back and think, I love the overcoat. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you good, know? No. It has a unity. It has yes, an absolute <laughs> elegant unity to it. Yeah. Um, oh. The classics, the early days. I've seen, uh, and not on recent, I sort of think recently, uh, you know, um, the film version of Frankenstein that came out, for, you know, that's the, of, um, is it the RNC that, yep. and, um, and the uh, Chekhov that they did, mm -hmm. that was just so beautiful. I love, I love pictures that resonate when a director has a picture and, you know, like there's, it, it, it's only lasting for a second, but something about it is so right, it imprints on my eyes. And years and years ago, I saw a production of Chekhov at BAMP, and there was a moment in that play that, w that was, you know, there were, you know, what was it, you know, Last Train to Moscow, whatever, <laughs> Three Sisters. Um, was it top? Was it top? We had a top, and the Three Sisters, That's right. they got the top going. Yeah. And they sat and watched the top. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so there's, mo you know, yeah, um, that was Laszlo Martin's. Yeah, production. it was. And there was something Did about that's the three that's women, and they got this child's top, and they were spinning it, and it made a sound uh -huh. that opened the heart. Yeah. The that was, so. so those are the kinds of things that I, you know, you saw too, eh? Yeah. Yeah. So the, it, it's um, um, buried child at the end of one of the acts when in in when. Uh, the uh, ugly older brother comes in, and there's the young girl, and, uh, and, and he comes in, and he walks over to her, and he says, open your mouth, and he puts two fingers in her mouth, and it's just going, <laughs> you know, like, that's moment, and I, I often use it in a workshop, saying, you know, we've, we've lost the power of metaphor, it seems to me. You know, a cheaper playwright would have had him throw her down on the sofa and rape her. That's what it's about. It's an intimate act you know, a violation, and, 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 and you know, how... Who are your favorite playwrights? Because that very child is Sam Shepard. Uh, well, I don't want to write like them. I like, I like Beckett. <laughs> Samuel Beckett is, mm -hmm. uh, is a fav, is a favorite. Uh, Pinter, and I probably go for some of those older ones. I love, I've always wanted to direct uh, Sergeant Musgrave's Last Dance, dance yeah. I love that play, and it really irritates me when I read what people say, well, it's not a pacifist play. Yes, it is. Are you crazy? What kind of a production did you see? You know? <laughs>